Hi folks, this is Mark by Mark A. Foster, PhD for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. First, I wanted to begin with a legitimate apology for not looking more into the camera. I reviewed my podcast yesterday. I think I did two yesterday, but the second one. And I realized I was looking over here or over there. That's kind of disrespectful. Um, imagine if I was having a conversation with you face to face and I was not looking directly at you. Well, it would look like I wasn't interested in you, that I really didn't care about you. That's not true. I do care about my audience, but it didn't look like it in my second podcast. So from now on, except when I am reading, I will make an attempt to always remember to look directly into the webcam. I think that is simple, common courtesy. So again, apologies, and I will try not to repeat that mistake again. I wanted to talk about the third world again, but from a somewhat different perspective. Now, the third world, as we think about it, did not make any sense until the Industrial Revolution, when the places that experienced industrialization are the places that became the first world. Places like the United States, Canada, much of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. Places that were left out of that many of them became a part of the third world. Not all of them. There were some countries that became a part of the first world more recently. Good examples. South Korea. Japan. But they are more exceptions. When we look at Latin America, when we look at the Caribbean, when we look at South America, most of the countries in those places are still third world countries. And none of them were a part of the Industrial Revolution, which basically brought the world or parts of the world out of agriculture into the factory system. So the previous economic revolution to the industrial revolution was the agricultural revolution which took place about oh 10,000 years ago that was a long time ago and there are still today many countries which if not immersed still primarily in agriculture meaning most of their money, most of their industry is derived from agricultural products. Still, they have not experienced full industrialization. They are still poor countries, unlike countries that did go through the original industrial revolution. Okay, now, I suppose I could end the podcast on that note, but I won't, because I have a couple of other points to raise in that connection. The problem I have with that, or one of the problems I have with that, is that me as a first worlder, and other people I know as first worlders, hardly ever talk about the third world. The third world is very rarely even discussed in the media. I mean, when I read the paper, which I always do online, um, most stories I've realized, most stories 
are about the first world, primarily about the U.S. and Britain, not even Canada, the U.S. and Britain. I don't know why. Well, maybe, maybe I do know why, because the U.S. started as a kind of offshoot from Britain. Maybe that's the reason why, but I don't know. There also seems to be a continuing fascination by many Americans with the British royals, which is something I don't understand. Now, I have nothing against them. Some of them are nice. Some of them are not nice. Um, I don't agree with the idea of a hereditary royalty. But beside that, who cares? I, that's not a big issue to me. What is a big issue is the absence of focus on the third world. So, using a critical realist perspective, which we have discussed before, dialectical critical realism, which you can see right here on the screen. You start with absence, then you absent the absence, and as a result, of absenting the absence, you have transformation. Well, right now, we have an absence in the attention that we in the first world pay to the third world. And that is not just a, an issue of disrespect. I mean, it is disrespectful. But if that's all it was, no. Well, why even bother talking about it? There's a lot of disrespect in the world today. People in the first world are often disrespectful of each other. I mean, here in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, I have never in my life seen such disrespect. Even growing up in New York City, where people honked each other all the time, it's nothing compared to here. As soon as the light changes, people begin honking their horns. What do I do? You guessed it. I honk my horn back. And sometimes I will press my horn and hold it down to make a point. Does that work? I have no idea. But who cares? That's just disrespect. And again, we find disrespect in many places. When I was in Switzerland for some reason, especially in Zurich, for some reason I found the people in Zurich, at least the ones I met, to be largely disrespectful. I don't know why. Maybe I just met the wrong people. I am open to that possibility. But the people I talked to um, seemed like they did not want to give me the time of day. That was my impression. Uh, that may be true in other parts of Europe, too. But I know when I was in Britain, that was not the case. So in Britain, that was not true. In Switzerland, it was true. I don't know why there is that disparity. But back to the subject. Not paying attention to the third world. Yeah, it's disrespectful. Sure, it's it shows a lack of consideration. Um, our news does not usually talk about the third world, except when there is some major disaster, as there is now in Gaza, for example. But otherwise... We in the first world, especially here in the U.S., very rarely hear about the third world. Why? I don't know. I guess because we're selfish. I guess because we're nationalistic. Something like that, I assume. But it has broader implications than that. Because not talking about the third world would tell me that we don't pay attention or we don't pay enough attention 
to the problems which plague the third world. And there are many of them. We have the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, Haiti, a third world country. Almost no one, including me. So I am not excluding myself. Almost no one in the first world appears to me to know anything about Haiti. And I admit that. I know that Haiti is a very poor place. I know there are a lot of people who don't get sufficient food and consequently suffer with starvation or malnutrition. But in terms of the daily lives of Haitians, I don't know anything about them. I do know a bit about India because I like India. But mostly when I say I like India and I know about India, I am talking about the Punjab because I like Sikhism. I like Hazrat Sultan Bahu. Both of those come from the Punjab. But when it comes to the rest of India, do I know much about it? No. I am as ignorant as most Americans are about India. I have a kind of fascination for it, but that's where it ends. It ends with fascination. I have never been there. I've been to very few third world countries. By very few, I mean two. Maybe that's not a few. Congo and Mexico, which is just two miles away. So that's kind of uh, irrelevant because I can just be there in, in a couple of minutes. But even Mexico, which is right around the corner from me, do I know much about Mexico? No, I don't. If somebody asked me who was the president of Mexico, I literally could not answer that question. Right now, I do not know who the president of Mexico is. Right now, I do not know who runs Congo. I barely even know the president of the U.S. Well, I know his name, Joseph Biden, but I don't know him. He is a stranger to me. He is an alien to me. He is an evil man to me. I don't want to know him. I feel the same about Benjamin Netanyahu. I know his name, but I wish I didn't. I wish I never heard of him in my life, which would mean that he was not involved in his constant war crimes, which is what will happen to him after his term as prime minister ended and ends, his war crimes tribunals will likely start. So, I really, to be honest, don't know about the world in general outside of the U.S., but especially I don't know about the third world. And to me, that is inexcusable. If I am a Maoist third worldist, if I am somebody who pretends to care about the third world, how can I be so ignorant about the third world, which admittedly I am? Why throughout my life have I only been to two third world countries? Why? It makes no sense. I should have been. The problem is, and now I am getting old, my opportunities for travel are rapidly coming to an end. In maybe 10 years, I will not be able to travel that much. 
even now, well, I can travel, but walking around that much, I get tired. I notice that when I'm walking around anywhere, after walking three blocks, I need to sit down. That was not true when I was younger. I mean, I can still get around. I can even run or jog, but I get tired after I run or jog, as I assume most people my age do. Um, but that tells me that my life is rapidly or gradually drawing to an end. Something which I do not mind at all. I want my life to rapidly draw to an end because I don't want to be here anymore. I have been on the earth too long, long enough. I remember there was all this fascination about life extension at one point. My sister, my estranged sister, was fascinated by the subject, as I recall. I could care less because I did not want to extend my life. Did I want to shorten my life? Mm, not really. Do I want to shorten my life now? Not really. I just wish that my life would end naturally, on its own, not by my intentionally shortening it, which to me would be something like, I don't know, assisted suicide. <laughs> um, but I still would like my life to come to an end. So since I am reaching that age at 68, um, there are certainly many years behind me than there are years ahead of me. My chances for going to the third world and exploring it are not that good. But I should. At least I should learn about it. I should read about it. I should read about and study the third world. You know, I became a sociologist because I was interested in studying society. It used to be that there was virtually no difference between sociocultural anthropology and sociology. Uh, the two fields were essentially one. For example, Emile Durkheim one of the most well-known figures in sociology is also a well-known figure in sociocultural anthropology. Because at that time, there was no real distinction. The split, the sundering between those two fields occurred. When sociologists demonstrated more of an interest in studying the first world and sociocultural anthropologists on the other hand demonstrated more of an interest in studying the third world so when i think about that i realize that from the beginning of my career my interest has been primarily in the first world now Perhaps I shouldn't blame myself too great. Um, I mean, we all want to learn about where we live, I think. At least I do. I live in the first world. And so trying to understand it, wanting to appreciate it more, makes sense. Wanting to understand the third world while a good idea is not something which would come naturally to me. I would have to cultivate that kind of interest, or I would have to have a hobby in studying the third world. I never did. I had loads of hobbies as a kid. The third world was never one of them. So literally, as a kid, 
I had no interest in the third world. And in my opinion, I was going to say that is shameful, but maybe that's an exaggeration. Maybe a better way of putting it is there is no excuse for that, especially at my age. As a kid, yeah. So what? As a kid, we want to understand the world around us. But as we get older, we should realize that the world, the country that we live in, is not the center of the earth. Despite the view of many Americans, the United States is not the greatest country in the world. Surprise, surprise. If anything, it is one of the worst countries in the world. It has horrible political corruption. I mean, look at what the U.S. is doing right now in relationship to Israel. We are the piggy bank for Israel in its war against the third world, Gaza. We are funding Israel. We are providing military assistance to Israel, a country which, as I speak right now, is engaged in war crimes. And yet practically every day, there are stories about Israel. There are very rarely stories about Gaza. Now, perhaps that might be understandable now, because journalists cannot, for the most part, get into Gaza. A lot of journalists have been killed by the Israeli Defense Forces. Western journalists, Israeli journalists, Gazan journalists, and other Palestinian journalists have been killed by the IDF. So Gaza is not safe. So if I were a journalist, if I were assigned right now to Gaza, I would have to think long and hard about it. What am I going to do? Would I go? Or would I say no and risk the possibility of being fired? I'm not sure. I am literally not sure. As a Maoist third worldist, I should be able to say yes. Yes, I will go. If, as I said before, I wish that my life would end now, that's mostly because I want to be in the next world as quickly as possible. But then I'm saying that I would not want to go to Gaza because I might be killed. That's a bit hypocritical. Maybe. But really, dying in Gaza is not what bothers me. What bothers me is being tortured. <sighs> that is the reason why I don't go to certain parts of Mexico. There are some places I do go, but there are other places like Reynosa which is very close to me, that I don't make a habit of going to. Why? Because if I, as an American, go to Reynosa, there is a chance, and I have no idea how to put a percentage on it, but there is a chance I could be tortured and killed, basically decapitated slowly, if you are eating and you just heard that, I'm sorry, but it's true. The parts of Mexico I go are relatively safe. And so I am comfortable going there. That's perfectly fine with me. But much of the third world is very poor. I remember 
when I was in Congo, the cab driver brought me to the place I was staying. Before we left, we made arrangements as to how much the cab ride would cost. When I got to the destination, the cab driver upped the fare by about four times. And I refused in principle. I said, no, I will pay you the exact amount that we agreed to at the beginning, which I did. And then I walked away. When I got inside this house, I mean, this is literally right after I arrived in Congo. I told them the story. They were angry at me. <sighs> Did they have a right to be angry at me? Mm, yes and no. I mean, I wasn't doing it out of uh, malice. I didn't know any better. I was new there. But I can understand why they would be angry. Maybe not angry at me, but they were angry at me. What they said to me is, why did you do that? Now we are a target. Now this guy is going to tell all of his friends. And they are going to try to break into our home. So I turned around and I looked outside their window. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I noticed that the window had bars on it. That is very common in many third world countries. The place where they lived had a guard. So what were the chances that these people would be invaded? I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert on Congo then or now. I mean, I was only there for two and a half weeks because things did not work out the way I thought they would. I don't think the chances were that great. I honestly don't think the chances were that great. But I can understand why they were afraid. Now that I know more about the third world than I did back then, the fact that they panicked makes sense to me. It is dangerous. There are a lot of very poor people in the third world, and I know nothing about them. Even when I was in Congo, I knew very little about the people I was talking with. I knew that many of them were starving to death. I knew that because of their bloated bellies. I would sometimes be sitting on porches with people with bloated bellies. And as an autistic, back then, before I had acquired the empathy that I now have, it had literally no emotional effect on me. There is no excuse for that. Well, may, maybe the autism is an excuse because that's not something I chose. I did not choose to be autistic. It is a neurological disability well, let me say it. It is a neurological curse. And I'm sorry if any of you listening or watching this podcast is a neurodiversity, a.k.a. anti-cure person. Because to me, autism is a curse. It prevented me from empathizing with the people I was with. Now I have empathy. Now I feel, and I feel horribly for the suffering of the people in the third world.
And yet I realize that even most autistics don't. Why? Is it because they don't have empathy? I don't think that's the reason, no. I think it is because they don't know about it. The media does not discuss it. It is simply not in the at the center of their attention. So literally, they have no reason to be concerned about the third world. I make a point to be informed about the third world. I love the third world. I despise the first world. Does that mean I despise first worlders? Well, some, <laughs> but most, no. Most, no, I, that would be kind of silly to despise people in general, just based upon where they live. But I despise this place. I despise the US. I despise all first world countries for taking advantage of the third world. Let me conclude on one note. Back in the 1980s, during the Ronald Reagan presidential administration. Ronald Reagan did something rather odd. Um, it is something which, in retrospect, seems kind of uncharacteristic, considering how patriotic Ronald Reagan pretended to be, or maybe was honestly. But I think he did it because he did not know what the ramifications would be of what he was doing. He established a policy of encouraging American corporations to go to the third world, especially Latin America. Why? Maybe some of you know. Reagan was obsessed by communism. He was terrified, irrationally terrified, that communism would take over Latin America, which of course has never happened. But he was terrified, not only that it would happen, but that it was happening during his administration which is not true. Now, were there some left-wing regimes in South America? One or two, but they were not communist. But to many right-wingers, left-wing and communist are the same, which is not true, which is inaccurate. But regardless, communism was not spreading in Latin America. There was no indication of any danger that it would. But supposedly to prevent communism from spreading in Latin America, Reagan introduced a policy whereby he would encourage American companies to move to Latin America. Now, what was the result of that? Well, there were many results. I'll give you a couple. One, that famous song by Billy Joel. We're living here in Allentown. They're tearing all the factories down. I think that's the proper lyrics. That's exactly what happened not only in Allentown, Pennsylvania, but throughout what is generally called the Rust Belt. Why? Because companies that were based in the Rust Belt, in the Northeast, in the Midwest, like all the way to Chicago, 
suddenly said, well, we're being given a financial incentive to move down to South America or other parts of the third world. But why did Reagan do that? Again, because he was afraid of the spread of communism. So he literally paid companies off to move to the third world. Now, I would like to see wealth in the third world, but not wealth through capitalism, wealth through collectivization, communist collectivization. But still, I would like to see wealth in the third world. But why was Reagan doing it? He was not doing it for what I would consider to be the right reasons. He was doing it out of pure irrationality. Now, Reagan eventually developed Alzheimer's disease. His wife, Nancy, one time was on the old Larry King live show on CNN. And there was a rather sad conversation. Now, I have I never liked Reagan. I used to call him by the famous nickname Ronnie Reagan because of his fascination with Star Wars, you know, putting these these uh these missiles in outer space that could shoot down uh atomic weapons. I despised Ronald Reagan. And I'm not afraid to say it. Nancy Reagan, though, seemed like a nice person. I had nothing against Nancy. Again, she was on Larry King Live on CNN. And by that time, everyone knew that Ronald Reagan had Alzheimer's. In fact, that he had Alzheimer's at least toward the end of his presidency. And Larry King asked Nancy a question. I thought it was rather inappropriate, but Larry knew Nancy. Larry knew a lot of people. He was a, a big celebrity in his own right. He was a whiner and diner. He lived in Los Angeles. He met a lot of celebrities. And when he had them on his show, he would treat them like friends. He's the only host of a TV program I know that would regularly address former presidents by their first names. That was, and still is, very rare, if not totally unheard of. But that's what Larry did. And CNN let him get away with it. Why? Well, I think it was because Larry King had the most popular show on CNN. So for that reason, they tolerated it. They tolerated it. Much as they tolerated the late Anthony Bourdain using profanity, where perhaps they would not have tolerated that with most other people at that time. And I I loved Anthony Bourdain, but that's that's an aside. Um so he asked her that. How is how is your husband? I think he said, How is Ron doing now? And Nancy said, Ron is not doing well. This is maybe two or three years after Ronald, Ronald Reagan left office. So it's, you know, not that long after his presidency. And she said, when I walk into the room, Ron does not even recognize me. He does not know who I am. And despite my bad feelings for President Reagan, for Ronnie Reagan or Ronald Reagan, whatever, that made me feel very sad because he was a man. 
a bad man, in my opinion, but a man. And Nancy was his wife. And I don't think that Nancy was a bad woman. And she was literally taking care of him. A man who did not know who she was. I suspect, can I prove this? No. That Ronald Reagan had Alzheimer's much earlier than it was revealed. We know that he started developing symptoms during his final year of presidency. Maybe those symptoms developed even earlier than that. If so, that would explain a number of things. The Iran-Contra affair. I remember when Ronald Reagan was being interrogated by Congress on that subject. Um, he would respond to questions, yes, no, whatever. He would openly respond to questions. And then somebody produced evidence that Ronald Reagan was not kept out of the loop. He knew all about the Iran-Contra affair, which Reagan was pretending he did not. What did Reagan do? Like that. That's what he did. You got me. You got me. So, point is that to Reagan, the third world was a means to an end. That end was fighting communism. Did Reagan begin the fight against communism in the U.S.? No. I mean, that goes back to Kennedy. The repeated attempts to assassinate F Fidel Castro through several presidencies. So no, he didn't start it. But he continued it. He certainly continued it. No excuse for that at all. Was Fidel a perfect man? No. But neither am I. Was he a good man? Yes. In my opinion, he was a great man. Were there some Cubans who disliked him? Yeah. But most Cubans loved him. Most. The Western media never discussed that. And so there we come full circle. Back to what is in the Western media about the third world. And again, the answer is not much. And so I realize that although I don't know hardly anything about most third world countries, and yet I call myself a Maoist third worldist, I am not alone. I am not alone. My students, I remember, did not know much about the third world either. Now, when I was lecturing, students could not tell. I hid that from my students, not intentionally, but because when I was lecturing on a subject, I made sure that I understood the subject in advance. So obviously, if I was talking about a particular country, I made sure I knew about that country beforehand. But with regard to most third world countries, I know almost nothing at all. What I know is what I have experienced primarily in Congo. Because when I go to Mexico, I go to safe places. I don't go to the places where I am likely to be decapitated. I go to safe places. Places where the military and the police are literally paid off by the cartels to protect the merchants and the tourists. That's why, in case you, you wonder why is a place like 
Nuevo Progreso so safe, which it is. It's right near me. It's a half hour drive from me. Mexico itself, two minutes. Why is Nuevo Progreso so safe? It's because the cartels pay the Mexican police and the Mexican military to let them continue their operations. And not only the Mexican police, the U.S. police, the cartels, the Mexican cartels, pay off the U.S. police to let them conduct operations in the U.S. So they're allowed to transport their drugs through their tunnels and from their tunnels to the rest of the U.S. Pure corruption. So, I need to learn more about the third world. I love the third world, but I'm a hypocrite. Because I know I love a place that I know next to nothing about. I shouldn't say a place. That even makes it worse. I love places that I know next to nothing about. Countries that, that I have hardly any information all about. Nothing. That is really, really, really unfair. I should not be like that. And so, what Reagan did in paying off those companies, which is actually what he did, not even personally, but his government, paying off companies to go to third world countries to fight communism. It created places like Allentown because it was no longer profitable to do business. I should say to do manufacturing in the U.S. Even if you ran a manufacturing company in the U.S. and you wanted to stay in the U.S., what do you do when all of your competitors have traveled to Latin America? You have no choice. If you want to stay in business, you have to travel there too now. Am I sobbing for the U.S.? No, not at all. Again, when I say I hate the U.S., I am being serious. What I am sobbing for is the third world. And how once again, once again, the third world is being used to prop up American industry. Now, I it's not that I don't care about people in places like Allentown back in the 1980s, but Allentown has recovered. They have built new industries. Allentown and the entire Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania is doing relatively well now. So I don't think about Le the Lehigh Valley that much. I do think about the third world. And I think about Reagan's motivations. One, to fight communism. And I am a communist. And two, to prop up American capitalists. And again, I am a communist. So nothing, literally nothing that Ronald Reagan did agrees with my own understanding of how the world should work. That is why I hate him. And I'm sorry to admit that. Because I really should not hate anyone. Hating people is not a good thing. There's nothing productive to be gained by hating people. Um, 
But I don't hate him intentionally. I don't wake up in the morning and think, I need to hate Ronald Reagan or somebody else. I just hate him. I just hate him. And I don't know how to stop hating him. Maybe I should stop. But if I should, I wish that somebody would tell me how. For the time being, this has been Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. Have a pleasant day and an even better day tomorrow.